we age. And one might well ask, is this even possible? Do the forces of ennui, anthropy, and apathy overtake us as we grow older? Another way of stating, I'm just, uh, hang on, we're, we're, we're checking something right now. And uh, Josh is doing it remotely. Oh, so. OK. Josh is doing it remotely. How nice. So hello to those here and online. We can thank Josh now. OK. <laughs> so again, the question. Can we even increase our creativity, or are we all going to fall into apathy and ennui, entropy? Another way of stating this dilemma in stark contrast is that we have two choices as we age. Becoming more creative, more artistic, more interesting, or becoming more boring, dull, and tedious. Needless to say, I want to pursue the first path while avoiding the second. I believe staying creative is the best antidote to becoming an old and tedious bore. Let me toss in through cautions to my fellow golden agers. Small talk can keep us small. And second, if we stop learning, we're less worth listening to. If one stops learning, the pull of apathy becomes too strong. So in this exploration, I'm going to use material from the psychologist Mahali Csikszentmihalyi. Csikszentmihalyi is considered a co-founder of what's known as positive psychology, which explores human happiness. And while his name appears unpronounceable, it's broken down as Chick sent me high. Now, even if his name is unfamiliar, his work is not. Almost, whoops. No. Lost her. I'm new to this technology, obviously. And there we go. So even if Mahali Csikszentmihalyi is unfamiliar, his work is not. Almost everybody has heard the term flow, which was the title of his worldwide best-selling 1990 book. Now I'm going to touch on two of Csikszentmihalyi's books. Creativity, Flow, and the Psychology of Discovery and Invention, published in 1996, along with Finding Flow, 
The Psychology of Engagement with Everyday Life, published in 1997. And if I was going to recommend one of his books, Finding Flow would be the book I'd recommend. I believe the experience of flow, which we'll get to in a moment, is the necessary fuel for almost all creative pursuits. Flow, according to Csikszentmihalyi, is a cognitive state where one is so completely immersed in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. And it involves an intense focus of one's attention and the loss of awareness of time and self. In other words, in flow, one pursues the activity for the joy of doing it rather than for any other reason. The activity is its own reward. Flow obviously can happen during activities such as painting, writing, prayer, meditation, gardening, reading, martial arts, yoga, playing an instrument, singing. The list is almost endless. But here's the thing. One normally has to push beyond one's so-called comfort zone to induce flow. Finding flow takes effort. And we'll return to that. As a baby boomer, I'm very aware of the physical, psychological, and spiritual challenges I face as I age. And while I'm certainly among those listed as elderly, I prefer to consider myself an elder. As an elder, one of my remaining life tasks is to formulate, to percolate, to distillate any wisdom that may have come my way during my long life. I don't know who that old guy is there. but <laughs> I'd like to suggest that the distillation of life wisdom may be the most critically important creative task that we face. And the distillation of life wisdom takes upon itself a radical intensity when facing a short runway. And the short runway metaphor was generated by something one of my dentists told me five years ago. At that time, I had experienced my first ever tooth extraction, a molar on my right side. I still possess my four wisdom teeth, uh, maybe because I have a big mouth. But I'm happy to have them because I could be mistaken here, but aren't our wisdom teeth the source of any wisdom we possess? <laughs> I could be wrong. Anyway, I asked my dentist if I should do something about the missing molar, like replace it with an implant. He looked at me and simply said, if your runway was longer, maybe then. <laughs> so I put vanity aside and admitted I was facing a short runway. And so it might be for many listening tonight. Perhaps we could start a group, the short runway gang. Among the challenges we elders face 
are not only the physical changes that accrue with our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, but the psychological and spiritual changes as well. My mother, God rest her, suffered from glaucoma, which narrows the vision until it's as if one is looking through a narrow tube. It's hard not succumbing to a narrowed vision as we age. It comes, as they say, with the territory. However, staying creative helps push against the age-related narrowing of our vision. Let's take a quick look at our brains. No surprise that our brains age along with the rest of us. Over the years, I've attended many workshops on aging and the impact on our brains. Obviously, brains and creativity are vitally connected. You can't have one without the other. I'm deeply interested in what happens to my brain as I age. I want to add something from one of my favorite writers. He must be everyone's favorite, Bill Bryson. This comes from his 2019 book, The Body, A Guide for Occupants. He writes, the great paradox of the brain is that everything you know about the world is provided to you by an organ that has itself never seen that world. The brain exists in silence and darkness like a dungeoned prisoner. It has no pain receptors, literally no feelings, it has never felt warm sunshine or a soft breeze. To your brain, the world is just a stream of electrical pulses, like taps of Morse code. And out of this bare and neutral information, it creates for you, quite literally creates, a vibrant, three-dimensional, sensually engaging universe. Your brain is you. Everything else is just plumbing and scaffolding. So it's worth pondering. And before reflecting on aging brains, let me add uh, a word about Bill Bryson. His travel books of course, are a delight. But the one book I often recommended during, you can't quite, uh, this is my first PowerPoint. Obviously, I've not yet um, become a master of this. So, But this is the book from Bryson I most recommended during the 15 years I taught college. Bill Bryson's 2003 book, a short history of nearly everything. It's a lovely, witty introduction to the various scientific fields. Some of it's now dated, but it's still very entertaining. Another aside, I love listening to books as I drive or exercise. I've listened to the complete Bible more than once, traveling the roads of northern Louisiana during seven years I spent there. Yes, I love listening to music and podcasts, but first and foremost for me remains unabridged books on tape. Last week, I finished the engaging don't know much about the American presidents. Do yourself a favor and get acquainted with the wonderful 
don't know much series. Another suggestion, become a denizen of your local library. Wander through the library stacks. Be on the lookout for titles that leap out at you. Not long ago, at the Wapaka Library, I stumbled upon a title I couldn't resist. 1,000 books to read before you die. Obviously, I have work cut out for me. I took the book home from the library and realized quickly I needed my own copy. I'm now going through this lengthy book at the slow pace of three entries, three titles a day. The process, at least for me, can't be rushed because of the necessary concentration. At this rate, it will take me approximately a year to finish. But I can't begin to tell you how many times I've been stunned by what I've come across. I thought I was reasonably well educated. This book throws doubt on my assumption. I'm in the F's right now. Do yourself a favor, get a copy. OK, back to the brains. Our brains shrink between 5% and 10% betwixt the ages of 40 and 70. However, this shrinkage accelerates after 70. By age 80, our brains have shrunk approximately 25%. Obviously not a good thing. And yes, we all suffer brain shrinkage. When I do something wrong, I just blame it on my shrinking brain. It can't be stopped. But it might be slowed a tad with exercise and lifelong learning. But because of brain shrinkage, falling is much more dangerous when we're elders. A gap opens up between our cranium, the bone shielding our brains, and our actual brains. Our brain matter is said to have the consistency of tofu or jello. If there's a large gap between the cranium and the brain, when we suffer a fall, our brains can be seriously jostled. No telling the trouble that can cause. Over the years, I've lost a good number of my older congregants to falls. So I suggest doing balance exercises regularly. One of the biggest problems I face in our Wisconsin winters, I moved up here about a year and a half ago. Biggest problems I face is the presence of ice in so many places. Recently, I was doing the penguin shuffle across some icy remnants in the parking lot. And I thought to myself, Thomas, you're walking like an old man. <laughs> then I laughed as it hit me. You're walking like an old man because you are an old man. A recent study found that dancing is an especially good exercise to retain brain sharpness. At three of the churches where I was pastor, I brought in dance instructors. 
And I'd suggest to any and all pastors, they might consider doing the same. I love swing. However, I could never grasp salsa. Being genetically Irish, my hips don't adequately swivel. <laughs> As the famous dancer Anna Helprin, who died last year at the age of 100, argued, dance is the mother of all the arts. And your body is your instrument. She concluded, live life as the continual dance. It's good advice. And as the well-known Leanne Womack song suggests, when you get the chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. But please, please remember, no elder should ever attempt to look like John Travolta on the dance floor. Trust me on this. <laughs> I've been a lifelong student of the brain, partially because my father died of brain cancer when I was 11. Two of my aunts in Ireland suffered Alzheimer's disease. My older brother suffers from Parkinson's disease. As many of us know, it's a problem with the neurotransmitter dopamine. You try to keep dopamine in the middle because too little dopamine, you have Parkinson's. Too much, you're schizophrenic. And so I've learned about neurotransmitters and the research happening now on the various neurotransmitters of the brain. They're, they've found about, about 60, and they're still finding more. I think the discoveries with neurotransmitters is very much a cutting edge in brain research. And I've tried to learn as much as I could over the years about the brain and how to keep it healthy. One of the reasons I pursued a master's degree in counseling psychology. Whatever is good for the body is good for the brain. Whatever is good for the brain is good for the body. A healthy brain undergirds creativity. Let me throw in a practical tip here. Stay hydrated. The brain is made up of almost 80% water. Most people believe they drink enough fluids, but our sense of thirst diminishes as we become elders. The older we get, the less likely we are to know when we're dehydrated. And our bodies need fluids to flush out toxins. Dehydration also can cause our blood to thicken, and that's never a good thing. As Dr. Sanjay Gupta writes in his 2021 book, Keep Sharp, Building a Better Brain at Any Age, he writes, dehydration is common in older people. It's a leading cause for admission to emergency rooms and hospitals for the elderly. He goes on, we often mistake hunger for thirst. He writes, our brains are not really good at distinguishing between those two, hunger and thirst. If there is food around, we generally tend to eat. As a result, he writes, we walk around overstuffed and chronically dehydrated. As a pastor, much of my time was spent visiting congregants in the hospital. I recall visiting an older congregant, a decidedly feisty widow. 
She had been brought to the hospital in semi-conscious, unconscious state. After a short time talking to one of her daughters, I decided to try something. I knew my congregant loved Pepsi. I went to a vending machine for a can. I got a straw and said, Peg, I have a Pepsi for you. She drank the Pepsi and left the hospital a day or two later. She had been severely dehydrated. So keep your creativity humming by staying hydrated. Csikszentmihalyi rightly argues, creativity is a central source of meaning in our lives. It allows a fuller participation in life. And if our life setting doesn't cultivate creativity, I believe discouragement and discontent can cloud our journey. However, creativity requires risk-taking and a radical curiosity about the world. Csikszentmihalyi points out, each of us is born with two contradictory sets of instructions. A conservative tendency made up of instincts for self-preservation, self-aggrandizement, and saving energy. And secondly, an expansive tendency made up of instincts for exploring, for enjoying novelty and risk. And we need both of these programs. But whereas the first tendency for self-preservation requires little encouragement or support from outside to motivate us, the second tendency can wilt if it is not cultivated. If too few opportunities for curiosity are available, if too many obstacles are placed in the way of risk and exploration, the motivation to engage in creative behavior is easily extinguished. Of course, as we age, risk taking is not usually high on our list of things to do. Not many 70 or 80 year olds are going to take up skydiving or competitive kickboxing. I love now watching the Winter Olympics. Every time I look at one of the venues, one of the, the, the athletes competing like in, in ski jumping or the big air thing and all those, I think, you know, maybe I want to do that. <laughs> of course, I am not <laughs> foolish enough to actually do it. Uh, since I only went skiing once in my life and it wasn't much fun. So, the <laughs> question is how can we elders enhance our creative impulses? Csikszentmihalyi argues with his research that people who keep themselves perpetually busy are generally not creative. Let me repeat this. Perpetually busy people are generally not creative. In his extensive research, he came to see that for creativity to grow, we need quiet time, time in which our brains are not engaged in other pursuits. Creativity, in other words, is enhanced by daydreaming. When we let our minds go where they will, it's often generated in quiet, unfocused mental states. I find myself, most nights, virtually every night, sitting in the dark as I prepare for bed, sipping a cup of herbal tea, letting my mind go where it will. 
I keep a notebook handy. The dark, the quiet, have much to teach us. Befriend the dark, befriend the quiet. Dr. Gupta argues that daydreaming can act like a neural reset button, a way for the brain to take a deep breath. And any of us working with any kind of technology today, we have to unplug it from time to time. It just goes bad <laughs> for whatever reason. So it's a good thing to take a breath and like a neural reset button. And that's what the dark sitting quietly can do. The neuroscientist David Eagleman, in discussing creativity, notes that the brain will always seek the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance, neurologically speaking, is what we've done over and over and over in the past. Our brains are inclined to stay in a rut because it's easier for the brain to do what it's done before. But the path of least resistance is not the path to creativity. Creativity involves less traveled paths. For instance, it's easy clinging to the answers we've come up with before. It's easy returning to the behaviors of the past. And truly, we need the comforts of the familiar. But we need to change direction if we want to enhance creativity. We need to move away from what we know and shift to what we don't know. Also, for creativity to grow, you have to increase the complexity of anything you're doing. This reminds me of something from martial arts. In all the years I took or taught martial arts, there was the idea of a worthy opponent. A worthy opponent was somebody who wasn't so far below you that you had no trouble defeating him or her, nor was that opponent so far above you that you had no chance. I tell the story, I was uh, this is down in Louisiana when I was in the martial arts. I was a red belt on my way to black belt. And we had a visitor to our dojang who was the kickboxing champion of the world. He came to visit us and because he was friends with my master. And so he and I decided to spar, to have a little fight. You know, you put the pads on, you do all the things. He crushed my nose. <laughs> he was sorry to do it, but his instincts were such that he couldn't kind of help himself. So just saying, I should have never stepped into that ring. So worthy opponent. Same thing with anything you're doing creativity-wise is you have to increase its complexity, but not too much or you'll get discouraged, not too little because it becomes boring. So something in the middle. Virtue, as we know, lies in the middle. Of course, however, the unfamiliar is frightening. Learning new things is not easy because it involves confusion. None of us like to feel confused. It's frustrating. So as we age, we often cling to past certitudes. It's just easier. 
That's probably why many of us become curmudgeons as we age. Listen to the Merriam-Webster definition of curmudgeon. A crusty, ill-tempered, and usually old man. Cautionary tale to my brother elders. <laughs> Creativity requires confusion. So if you feel confused, good for you. I certainly place myself among the perpetually perplexed. To enhance creativity, one must be willing to be wrong. Let me suggest that one of the best antidotes to becoming a curmudgeon is to frequently say, I could be wrong here. We don't hear that phrase often enough from all of us, myself included. Now we probably know that two of the best things we can do for our brains as we age are learn a new language and play a musical instrument. Let me add a third. Immerse yourself in the world. Drink in the world. Be deeply and wildly interested in the world and everything in it. If you haven't studied cosmology, do it. If you haven't studied quantum physics, do it. It's all there on YouTube. And amazing stuff that you can find. Take your experience of the world and produce something that has never been before. Each of us has this creative potential. Each of us can best be described as the solo artist of his or her own life. We are all solo artists. As the irreverent, I like this guy, but the irreverent Irish writer Oscar Wilde phrased it, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. I'm reminded of two passages from my current favorite poet, Mary Oliver. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. From her poem, Sometimes. And doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? The summer day. And here's an additional life mantra I came across recently from the expert on aging, Ken Dykwald. Breathe, learn, teach, repeat. His book, um, new book, Radical Curiosity, is a very interesting book. Again, I found in upstairs. Why is it that many of us elders seem to lose our sense of wonder as we age? Many elders allow the inevitable pull of entropy, the draining of our life energy, to overshadow what's left of our one wild and precious life. Again, from Csikszentmihalyi. Life is nothing more than a stream of experiences. The more widely and deeply you swim in it, the richer your life will be. I'm not a fan of Freudian terminology. I, I prefer Jung. but. Freudian terminology, we can speak of life as the never-ending battle between eros, 
the life force, and Thanatos, the death force. As we age, I, this is my own thought, as we age, we kind of move a bit from the influence of Eros over to the influence of Thanatos. I could be wrong there, but I'm talking myself. As we age, we inevitably come under the dark influence of death. I suggest embracing the dark humor of the Irish regarding death. Watch the movie Waking Ned Divine for a glimpse into this humor. Great fun. You, you need the subtitles because uh, the Irish brogue sometimes is hard to understand. Creativity can be understood as our pushback against death. As Rollo May, one of my favorite uh, philosopher psychologists wrote in My Search for Beauty, only when we confront death in some form or other only when we realize that life is fragile do, do we create beauty. I believe the pursuit of beauty and the process of creativity are eternally intertwined. What will we leave behind? What will our legacy be? The question weighs heavily on the minds of us elders especially during this terrible time of COVID. Elders, because of the pre-existing condition of being old, are living through what could be termed a near-death experience. During the past two years of seclusion, of self-imposed cloister, I've seriously pondered my own legacy. If I come down with COVID, would I be swept up into eternity? I've done everything I can to forestall that possibility, but boy, oh boy, I'm speaking for all of us. I want this pandemic to be gone or at least better controlled. Ken Dykewald, in his new book, Radical Curiosity, describes this time of COVID as a collective chrysalis. We have to wait and see what emerges from this COVID cocoon. I hope it's more than just a further fractured country. Perhaps it will lead to a renaissance of creativity and compassion. That's my hope. But along with the commentator David Brooks, I worry about dark diabolical forces that work at work among us and within us. Csikszentmihalyi offers a clue to these forces. In order to make sure that we survive in a dangerous world dominated by scarcity, our genes have programmed us to be greedy, to want power, to dominate others. For the same reason, the social group into which we are born teaches us that only those who share our language and our religion are to be trusted. In other words, there may well be genetic factors suppressing our expansive creativity. Still pondering death, let me suggest that we elders might consider the creative act of fashioning what's called an ethical will. An ethical will is an ancient Jewish tradition where one creates a legacy letter for one's family and friends. Basically, in an ethical will, you tell your story, the values you embraced, and any wisdom you wish to pass on. In an ethical will, one answers the question, what has life taught me? There's much information and even templates online for writing ethical wills. One could even consider doing this as a scripted video. So as we boomers pass into eternity, 
more than $50 trillion of wealth in this country alone will be transferred to our heirs and to charities, making it the largest transfer of wealth in history. I believe adding some wisdom to the mix would be a good thing. Now, I know there's many artists in the Wapaka area, but maybe we should not limit the term artist only to those who work as traditional artists. Artists can work in a great variety of mediums. One of the dictionary definitions of artist is a person skilled at a particular task or occupation, a virtuoso of something. Garden artists, culinary artists, musical artists, child care artists, medical care artists, design artists, and on and on. As a writer, I work with the medium of words. I'm in the process of finishing my next book, The Three Pillars of a Sane Spiritual Life. I hope this will be part of my ethical will for my grandchildren. As a writer, let me give you a quick method to discern if one's writing is good or not. Read it out loud. Some years back, a psychologist friend of mine who had just completed a manuscript titled Will Our Love Last? gave it to me to edit. When I handed the edited text back to him, I said, Sam, read your manuscript out loud. Get your hearing involved. Good writing sounds good spoken. And that piece of advice transformed his text into a more conversational book. He thanked me in his preface. A few thoughts about words from Csikszentmihalyi. What makes words so powerful is that they enrich life by expanding the range of individual experiences without stories and books. Imagine, without them. We would be limited to knowing only what has happened to us or to those we've met. But more important, the written word allows us to understand better what's happening within ourselves. So as a writer, I stay immersed in words. I very much enjoy the Merriam-Webster daily word emailed to me each morning. And to enhance our creativity, we need to understand the technology available to us. I'm happy when the Wapaka Senior Centers offers technology classes. It can be maddening, but it's a blessing. Csikszentmihalyi argues, if in the later years we look back with puzzlement and regret, unable to accept the choices we have made and wishing for another chance, despair is the likely outcome. But if I have identified with more enduring entities, if I love my grandchildren or the work I've accomplished or the causes I've championed, then I am bound to feel a part of the future, even after death. Jonas Salk calls this attitude being a good ancestor. I love this phrase, being a good ancestor. Again from Csikszentmihalyi, find out what you like and what you hate about life. It is astonishing how little most people know about their own feelings. I fear many of us live in a fog of indifference, kind of chronic apathy, where we don't really know what's going on within our own hearts and souls. Creative people, says Csikszentmihalyi, are in very close contact with their emotions. Csikszentmihalyi suggests start doing more of what you love less of what you hate. Find a way to express what 
moves you. It may sound easy, but it's not. Find a way to express what moves you could well be the most important suggestion of this talk. You want to paint? Start painting. You want to play music? Start playing. You want to become a writer? Start writing. I remember calling my publisher shortly after my first book, Shaping a Healthy Religion, was published. The receptionist answered, uh, the receptionist answered the phone. When I asked to speak to my publisher, she asked, who's calling? I replied, Thomas Aldworth. And she responded, the author? I was momentarily silenced. <laughs> Me, an author. Something I'd always wanted to be. Yes, I finally responded, the author. Csikszentmihalyi rightly cautions. After creative energy is awakened, you have to protect it. If you do not, that energy will be broken down. And your thoughts will return to their baseline state, the vague, unfocused, constantly distracted condition of the normal mind. To be creative, to enter flow, we must learn to concentrate our attention. And by the way, reading has been shown to be the main source of flow worldwide. Creative people are easily surprised. They don't assume that they know what's happening around them, and they don't assume that anyone else does either. They question the obvious. Let me add a caveat. Questioning the obvious is a two-edged sword. Can generate creativity, but can also send one down conspiracy rabbit holes. We should question creatively, but cautiously. We need to seek what Carl Bernstein calls the best available version of the truth. I love what the French writer Jean Sullivan said, I write in order to lie less. Great for writers. Chick sent me high, says if you do anything, well, it becomes enjoyable. The more activities we do with excellence and style, the more life becomes intrinsically rewarding the more likely we are to experience increased states of flow. Usually we feel too bored and apathetic to move into the flow zone. So we prefer to, feel our, to fill our mind with ready-made prepackaged stimulation like TV. We feel too overwhelmed to imagine we could develop the appropriate skills for something more engaging. For my last birthday, with a gift from my twin brother, I purchased a keyboard. Decades, decades ago, I took piano lessons, but didn't stick with it. I have resurrected my old desire to play the piano. But it's hard starting over. Chopsticks, anyone? <laughs> Chick sent me high also likes for people to have hobbies. Studies show that hobbies are two and a half times more likely to produce a state of flow than watching TV. And most of us probably have a hobby. And we need to, of course, cultivate our curiosity. That was the point of the classic education, which we've now gotten away from. Csikszentmihalyi points out, the world is absolutely full of interesting things to do. Only a lack of imagination or lack of energy stand in the way. Each of us could be a poet, a musician, inventor, explorer, scholar, scientist, artist, 
or collector. And we're all in this together. My hope when the pandemic ends to start a monthly philosophy group for elders. Coffee, tea, or Nietzsche, anyone. So it could ex place where we can explore what my favorite philosopher, Jacob Needleman, calls the questions of the heart. Why am I here? Death the end? How should I best live my life? Does God exist? Why does evil exist? As Needleman argues, people who come together to discuss these questions can help each other enormously in a way that we don't get helped by either therapy or political discussions. In the last two small groups I've been invited to, I boldly asked everybody there, what do you think happens to you when you die? opened up lots of interesting discussion. I'm just saying that in case you want to invite me. You, know, just, um, you have to be part of something greater. So let me end all this by repeating an earlier quote from Mary Oliver. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. OK, so questions. Can I announce the telephone number? Are we up and running? No. Okay. We can have comments and or questions. Use the microphone. Larry. I have a question. Sure. I love the presentation, and I have to say, I'm glad you didn't tell us where you got all those fancy degrees ahead of time. That would have colored my appreciation of what you had to say. But now that it's over with and we all loved it, where the hell do you go to school? <laughs> Quincy College, Quincy, Illinois. Catholic Theological Union, Chicago, Illinois. Louisiana Tech uh, University in Ruston, Louisiana. And back to Chicago Catholic Theological Union and other places. I've been going to classes everywhere. <laughs> so. Thank you. <clears throat> the microphones are all live, so if anybody has a question they'd like to come forward, uh, While we're waiting for Pat, um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of saw a, um, a bit of a contradiction or conflict in a part of the presentation. At the beginning, I was very enamored with your um, statement that said it was kind of the process of the doing and it didn't talk so much about results but then here towards the end you talked about um, that there be excellence and style which sounds to me more like the result rather than the doing can you pull that together for me they you know the it's the the question of yeah everybody starts as a beginner right you have to start somewhere. But beginners typically aren't going to create anything of import. That you do have to increase the complexity, like I talked about. You have to increase that. And then, once you're in a domain, whatever that artistic creative domain is, you can, you have to be mentored probably in it. You have to learn about it, and you have to practice it. So to do it, when he talks about excellence and style, uh, he, he's talking about it from, from his viewpoint, which is um, anything you do with excellence and style. And you know, it could be innate. You know, it could be something you're born with. It's that great fight between you know, Beethoven and Mozart. My wife, bless her, uh, loved Mozart. I didn't. Uh, he was too talented. <laughs> <laughs> I preferred Beethoven, who struggled with it again and again and again. So I prefer the ones who struggle. But yes, I, I, I see what you're saying, and with the, with the you know, excellence in style. And um, I would hope 
that one learns that if you're in the field, like uh, any kind of domain. If I was going to start painting, which I never have, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't do it with excellence in style. Uh, so yeah, that is uh, it's a good point. It's uh, I don't know the answer. I'm at the microphone finally. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your talk, Tom. Thank you. Um, I wanted to inject the idea of plasticity because yeah. I think that's the most encouraging thing for an elder. Yeah. Is that uh, we're not done deals, uh, you, that you can create new pathways uh, musically and yeah. language wise yeah. in the yeah. arts. Do you want to comment on that, please? So brain, brain plasticity is an incredibly big field now. And, and it does offer a lot of, of, of hope. Um, there's, you know, the, um, let's see if I can find something. Um, there's, you know, parts of the brain which actually produce neurons, keep producing it neurons. Uh, hippocampus does. I found something recently that if you eat crunchy foods, it may help you produce more neurons in your hippocampus, which of course is connected with, with memory. Who knew? I mean, this is crazy stuff. <laughs> you know, it's just wild, the stuff that's coming out. But I was talking about neurotransmitters. That's an amazing field right now. You know, we're, we're familiar with dopamine probably, uh, which, which is also something which produces addiction in a lot of people. If something's going to make you an addict, it's going to be dopamine doing it. There's serotonin, which we know a lot of people who are depressed take the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, to keep more serotonin in your brain. But the plasticity idea is, yes, you know, you look at the studies done, say, on uh, Catholic sisters, religious sisters, they, they, it, when they died, uh, they, were, they did autopsy on many of them. They found many of them had what looked like Alzheimer's, but it didn't show up because they, they kept working at it, uh, learning all of that. The plasticity um, is, is something, though, that's still uncertain. Can we help it along? Is it the brain that's doing this, the new pathways being made? We know that if people get injured, you know, the brain can forge new pathways. The whole question of strokes, you know, we know of people who have had strokes and can indeed come back from it depending. And uh, so the field of neuroplasticity is an amazing field. And uh, uh, certainly something that should give us all hope. Anything else? I've got a few comments here on our, our Facebook feed. Um, just saying, I love the idea of being a good ancestor. Another one, thanks for the thought-provoking presentation, Thomas. A great prompt for further conversation. Oh, nice. Thank you. Let me just uh, add, if uh, then we can wrap up. If, uh, sure. Sure. They, uh, I have all kinds of notes uh, uh, in case there were no questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, say the uh, Edward O. Wilson, you may know his name, a uh, Harvard uh, uh, biologist and lovely writer, he said some time ago, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And uh, you know, that's, that's, it's such an inner, I'm going to leave these books here, by the way, if you want to take a look at them. And uh, I say, I think this is, if you want a real practical book to go into this whole thing of flow, um, I wouldn't read flow, I wouldn't read creativity, that's a very hard read. 
but uh, this one, finding flow, I think is, it, it's got a lot of practical things in it uh, regarding families, you know, regarding, you know, it's bring up stuff that's so interesting, like, you know, it's better for families to fight than, than ignore each other. We know those kind of things, you know, that uh, have been around psychology for quite some time. Uh, so, but that quote from, from uh, uh, Wilson, I think, is very interesting. And Csikszentmihalyi also points out the real problem today when we don't trust any of our institutions any longer. We certainly don't trust anybody who's running them. And when that happens, we really run into a place that's not so good because it's, again, we need to be tied to something bigger than ourselves, And that seems to be a real problem uh, today. So I'm, I'm delighted you're here. I'm delighted we somehow got uh, uh, everything working. And I was able to figure this out in process. And uh, always, I was the last person who did the presentation two years ago in the hall. And then everything had to shut down. I did a presentation on, on um, critical thinking. And uh, so uh, hopefully not too far down the road. And as I say, I'm now a member of the Wapaka community and trying to figure out uh, how to fit in, because I am urban. and. Uh, <laughs> But I, I now I'm speaking of downtown Wapaka. And uh, <laughs> so little by little, uh, getting there. So thank you much. Thank Bless you. This guy's terrific. You know? he does a lot of stuff. I, I'm surprised. He, I'm sorry he didn't say we were talking about learning new things as we continue to age. The whole power. That's the first power point they ever did. It was great. And taking the on is a challenge when you're, you know, it's not something you've ever done before. Right. Finished? So how much of anything can we get here?
So, Thomas, you're going to start your group? I hope so. I don't have a time. Sure, sure. You know, we got to wait to see, but yeah, we want to do it. I love people. It's a good umbrella for the topics, you know. And by the way, I'm a big Mary Oliver fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's called devotions, yeah. That's the one I read from it. Yeah. 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 Oh, 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 just let me know. Okay. okay. When I used to be, I used to be on Facebook until I raised the weather.